Now, this will be my first learning session with Milton Friedman. God rest his soul. And word through the grapevine is he was Thomas Sowell's mentor. Let that sink in and marinate for a minute. I was just getting into it. We need an understanding of the real nature of freedom, economic and political, and the interrelationship between the two. We need really to have a greater understanding of the kind of system, the kind of principles that have enabled us to, to get this great achievement of the past 200 years. We need to understand how it is that a free market works to enable millions of people to cooperate peacefully together. I know no better way to bring this out than by a very simple example that I owe to an old friend of mine, Leonard Reed, who once wrote a little article called I the Pencil. This is the only prop I have for this TV show. As you can see, it's a plain yellow pencil. Said Leonard Reed in his article, you know, it's a funny thing, he said, there's nobody in the world who knows how to make a pencil. Now, that seems like a silly thing to say, isn't it? Hmm. This is just the most obvious thing. It's only a piece of wood with a I something don't. black in the middle and do a little you? red tip at the end. What do you mean nobody knows how to make a pencil? Well, suppose you were to start to set out to make a pencil. First of all, you have to get some wood, don't you? Where do you get the wood? You have to go to the Pacific Northwest, probably, and cut down some trees. How do you cut down some trees? You have to have some saws to cut it with. Where do you get the saws? You have to have some steel. Where do you get the steel? You have to have a steel mill. In order to have the steel mill, you have to get the iron ore, and you can add all the rest. So in order to know how to make a pencil, you would have to know everything there is to know about how to start from iron ore and coal and get iron and convert it into saws and cut down trees. But that's only the beginning. This black stuff in the middle that we call lead isn't lead. It's graphite, I think. I'm not absolutely sure. And I am told it comes from some mines in South America. So in order to get that black stuff in between, you would have to take a trip down to South America and know all about how to extract graphite from the mines in South America. Now this little red tip at the top, that's rubber. Where does it come from? Well, the major source of natural rubber is Malaya. That's quite another distance. And I don't know how many of you know that the rubber tree was not native to Malaysia. It was originally imported into <laughs> Malaysia by private enterprises trying to make some money. And they transplanted it from somewhere in South America. I think it was Brazil, but I don't guarantee that. And they brought it over into Malaysia and established the, pla uh, the plantations there and got this rubber. So somehow or other, in order to make a pencil, you'd have to know about the rubber. Now there's a little brass tip around here, and I've run out of my own technological knowledge. I don't have the slightest idea where that comes from, though there are probably people in the audience who could tell us. Humble. Nobody I like this guy. Nobody knows how to make a pencil. But the miracle of this pencil isn't that nobody knows how to make it. The miracle of the pencil is how did it get made? Who told that fellow over in Malaya to tap his tree and send a little bit of rubber over here to put at the end of this pencil so I could have a pencil in my hand? What's happened? What is hey, it boy. that has enabled this little elementary transaction to take place? I'm not sure what the price of this thing is nowadays. These things change so fast. <laughs> when I first started hearing about this story, it was a nickel pencil, but that won't do anymore probably two for a quarter or 15 cents a piece. But what happens when I go down the store and I put down a quarter and get two of these pencils? I am trading with thousands of people all over the world, people in Washington State who are cutting down trees, people in South America, people over in Malaya. I'm making a deal with them. I'm saying to them indirectly, I'll give you two minutes of talk for two of these pencils. In fact, I, I, I hope I've underpriced myself in that <laughs> calculation. But I say, Milton, you're selling yourself short now. how is that now. brought about? Is there some commissar sitting in some central office who is sending out orders to these people in Malaya, to these people in South America, to the people in Washington? How is it that they are led to cooperate with one another? That's the miracle of the price system. Because note, 
these thousands of people who have been led to engage in this simple transaction with me, not one of them has been forced to do it. Nobody has had a gun to his head. They've all done it. Why? Because each one of them thinks he's better off in this transaction. And somehow or other, I've done it because I think I'm better off. Everybody has benefited. There's been no central direction. Capitalism. These people who have cooperated with one another don't speak the same language. They're people of all different religions. They may hate one another in every respect. But this hasn't prevented them somehow or other from being led to cooperate together. It hasn't prevented some kind of a wonderful machinery from bringing together these various components all together into this little pencil. What is that machinery? What is it that has induced people to do this? How has it been brought about? That machinery is the price system. That machinery is what the story is all about. That machinery is what enabled the United States to develop as it did. Because it's this price system which has the great virtue that it doesn't require any central direction. It doesn't require any commissars. It doesn't require people to be able to talk the same language. It doesn't require to be, be, people to be of the same religion. In fact, the beauty of the price system is that when you buy this pencil, you have no idea the religion of the people who went into it, whose work went into it. When you buy your daily bread, you don't know whether the wheat was grown by a black man or a white man, by a Chinaman or an Indian matter. or uh, anybody else. And as a result, the price system enables you to have cooperation among millions of people peacefully, cooperating on one little phase of their life while each one goes about his own business in respect of everything else. Mm. Unity. Knowledge is powerful. Between Milton and Thomas Sowell, we can finally put YouTube to, to good use and learn some valuable things. I really admire his talent to describe complicated ideas in such a way that a fool can understand. These are very complex things. You never think about all the, the moving parts and pieces that go into making like a pocket knife, a pencil, headphones, a Bible even, like a, a, a keyboard, this, this water bottle, let alone my, my camera lens, my microphone, light bar, computer, computer monitor, all of that. Like there's so many things that, that go into it and so many different pieces needed and, and knowledge needed that capitalism is it's a beautiful thing. It works so well, it works so efficiently that ordinarily we're not aware of it. It's like the, uh, your car. It never occurs to you what a complicated business it is until three o'clock in the morning on a dark yeah. road, it stops functioning. And then you suddenly realize it's a complicated mechanism. And it's the same way with the price system. So long as it is working, so long as it's operating, so long as it's being, bringing people together, it doesn't even occur to you that it's this kind of a complicated mechanism. Mm. How is it that it achieves this bringing of people together? Fundamentally at bottom, the essential, uh, the essential idea of the price mechanism is that both parties to a transaction can benefit, provided it is voluntary and not coerced. There's a terrible tendency and most economic fallacies derive from that tendency to think of everything as what the game theorists have come to call a zero-sum game. To think there's a fixed pie. And if I get more, you must get less. If somebody was able to make a fortune for himself, he must have done it by grinding under his heel the poor people, because the pie is it's fixed so messed and takes up a that way of pie. thinking. The great insight behind the free market, the great insight of Adam Smith's great book, The Wealth of Nations, was that it is not a zero-sum game. That it is possible for both people to afford to a transaction to benefit. And that this insight can be used to organize people's activities over a very wide area. It's very easy to see that principle operating if you think of, of two people under any circumstances making a voluntary deal. I'll give me, I'll trade my penknife for your roller skate. Clearly, that isn't a deal unless both people are better off. It's much harder to see how that same principle is involved 
in the far-flung transactions that went into making this pencil. And yet the same principles are there. The price system operates in this way because it doesn't require orders. It operates in this way because it can transmit information in a very efficient way without any person having to send an order. Mm. Right on the head, nailed it. Milton Friedman is a national treasure, and this is perhaps the best 10 minutes you could spend to understand why capitalism works and socialism doesn't. Remember, socialism doesn't reward people for their creativity. It awards the state. So this video right here, in my opinion, should be shown to every kid in schools starting at around the sixth grade on up from there. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I personally love the way we've set things up in the United States. And unlike any other form of economy, capitalism works because competition. In a capitalist society, there's numerous vendors selling products to the people. Now, because of this, vendors try to innovate and create better and unique goods to draw consumers in while lowering the price to undercut one another. So to wrap it all up with a beautiful little bow, it helps others by providing a good or a service to aid in their lifestyle. So everybody wins. So capitalism provides consumers with choices. It's greater efficiency to the economics of it. And capitalism allows the marketplace to set prices instead of the government. Those head honchos in charge, they don't get to make the rules. The marketplace does. It benefits the seller and the consumer. People can disagree with Milton all they want, but after doing a little research, there's no questioning his economic expertise. Professor Milton Friedman was awarded the 1976 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics for his contribution to consumption analysis and to monetary history and theory, including his observations of the complexity of stabilization policy. And that's a mouthful, but the dude knows his stuff. So if you're new, welcome. But for those of y'all that have been around for a while, you know I couldn't go through an entire video, no matter what the topic of discussion is, without mentioning the Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth because at the end of the day you can make as much money as you want to but jesus says in matthew 6 verse 24 that no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve god and money so eyes off the phone stop scrolling on those devices you can make again it's not bad to make money it's not bad to take care of your family but at the end of the day if your eyes are more on the phone and more on money than looking at the throne the truth where god sits and you're not looking at jesus the way the truth the life to get to the father to get to heaven to find that forgiveness and that eternal peace then then what are you really doing because at the end of the day you can't take any of these things with you jesus also says that in matthew 19 24 again i tell you it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of god and he also also says in Matthew 6 verse 19 through 21 this will be the last one I share with you then you can roll on about your day do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also I'm just saying, Jesus said it himself. That's the Messiah. That's the King. So that's what I put all my trust in. Either way, I'm sure people are going to disagree with what I got to say, just like some people are going to disagree with capitalism, what Milton Friedman, Thomas Sowell, what anybody has to say. Somebody's always going to disagree, but comment your thoughts below. Let's keep this conversation rolling. Let's keep it respectful. Big boys, big girls, adult conversations. Respect each other's opinions because once logic gets out the window and emotion takes over, nobody wins, no matter what. It's just going to be an arguing, bickering, back and forth, bashing, belittling. Nobody wins in that situation. So let's keep it respectful respectful down below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you stay up to date on all my videos. Share this video whether you agree or disagree with my take on Milton Friedman right here in this lesson of the pencil. Uh, if you want to support the channel, you can tap the thanks button. All my other links are in the description if you want to support the channel even further. Monthly, you can join the Patreon family, request songs, all of that. Everything as far as products I use, everything I stand by is all always linked in the description section. But outside of that, I love y'all. I'm praying for you. Till next time, Godspeed. I'm gone.